From Bloomberg News and iHeartRadio, it's The Big Take. I'm Wes Kosova. Today, Amazon's big bet on football just might pay off. The NFL announcing new 11-year media distribution deals with all of its media partners. This collective deal is worth more than $100 billion over the next 11 years, with its media partners paying on average about double what they paid before. The NFL announced a new series of long-term TV deals, including a historic contract that gives Amazon exclusive rights to Thursday football broadcast. Viewership during the regular season is expected to be down about 3% from a year ago. It's Amazon. They're being blamed for this drop as Thursday night football moved exclusively to prime video this season. Like you heard just there, Amazon is paying billions of dollars to lure viewers away from the TV networks and onto their prime streaming service. And with the Super Bowl coming up fast, it seemed like a good time to see how that deal is panning out. Because if it's a success, the way you watch football and just about any other sport is going to change dramatically. And maybe not in ways you like. And speaking of big bets on sports, at the end of this episode, I'll chat with Bloomberg Opinion Editor Tim O'Brien. He's the host of the new podcast, Crash Course, and he's launching a series of episodes digging into the booming sports betting industry. But first, my colleagues Jerry Smith and Felix Gillette, they've been covering the Amazon deal and all its implications, and they join me now from New York. Jerry, maybe I'll start with you. Amazon made a big bet on the NFL last September. How's that working out? Well, they just completed their first regular season where Amazon had the exclusive rights to Thursday Night Football. And the ratings, you know, they were better than what a lot of people expected, but they were a lot less than what they did the year before on traditional TV. Everybody in the sports media industry was watching this very closely because you know, this is really a new frontier. You know, this is the first time that you could watch America's most popular sport only on a streaming service. And there were some real challenges and real questions going into this. One being, can Amazon pull this off just from a technical standpoint? Live streaming is very challenging. We've seen a lot of streaming services broadcast sports and have glitches where the stream would just completely crash and fans would miss a last minute goal or touchdown. Amazon did not have any problems this season. They did not have any reports of the stream crashing or anything like that. So just on that level, it's a success. Uh, from a viewership standpoint, this was about a 40% drop from what it was the year before when it was on Fox, the NFL Network, and Amazon. It was a, what's called a, a tri-cast where you could watch the games on all three networks. This year, you could only get it on Amazon. So there was a real learning curve for people who have for years expected to get NFL games on their TV. Now, all of a sudden, you've got to teach them. You've got to download Prime Video. You've got to have a Prime subscription. So there was real questions about how that would go. And I think that Amazon overall is pretty pleased with the numbers, but it was not as much as what people were watching on, on TV. And, and that raises some interesting questions as well. I mean, I suppose you'd expect that, right? Because if you don't have a Prime account, which is now, what, 139 bucks a year, the chances are you're going to pay that just to watch Thursday Night Football was pretty low. So Amazon kind of thinks that's going to creep up. Do you think that that's likely to happen? Yeah, I mean, you know, they say that there's about 80 million people who watch Prime Video, which is about the same as the number of people who are watching cable TV. In fact, a little bit more. A lot of these people had to be trained to go to Amazon Prime Video to watch the games. I know that when I was getting Amazon Prime boxes delivered to my home, they were advertising Thursday Night Football and the top of the Amazon.com homepage had banners saying, you know, our first regular season game is on Prime Video. Here's how to get it. It's a little bit challenging as a fan. You, suddenly now, if you want to flip between the game and something else, you now have to leave the app, go to your cable system, flip the channel and go back and forth. It's not a seamless experience like it is if you're just watching on TV. But overall, Amazon said that that first game was they saw a huge increase in Prime subscriptions. So just on that level, I think that they're pretty happy about how things went. And I think also from Amazon's perspective, they have a different 
business model than the TV network. So it's not, you know, just about getting the audience there and serving them advertisements. It's just bringing them into the ecosystem where you can then sell prime subscriptions. You can hit advertisements. You can get merchandise. There's just in terms of delivering time on the app, I, I'd say it's a win for Amazon overall. The technology standpoint, I actually thought it was pretty easy if you were using on a mobile device. I was just like wandering around the house with my phone and, you know, you could open up the Prime app or, or the Amazon shopping app. They always had it advertised prominently on there. One click and you're right in. So I think for the first season, I think they probably have to be pretty pleased with how it went. Yeah, I should mention they also had a lot of help. They got a legendary NBC sports producer, Fred Gadelli, to be the producer for these games. So they had NBC essentially doing the production for them. So if you watch Thursday Night Football on Amazon, it looked a lot like NBC's Sunday Night Football games. But the point you made before about how Amazon has a different business model, I mean, I think that's what's really fascinating and a little scary for the CBSs and the NBCs and Foxes of the world is all of a sudden they're now competing for sports rights with these massive tech companies who have incredibly deep pockets and also have different business objectives. Apple is another company that we've seen get into sports. They are about to start a, a Major League Soccer package that they won the rights for, and they had Major League Baseball games last year. And all of a sudden, you've got a company like Apple. You know, a win for them could be you buy more Apple devices. They want to draw subscriptions to Apple TV+. Plus. Uh, they want to sell advertising. Amazon, they want to sell Prime subscriptions. They want to sell advertising. It's just a different business than you know, ESPN, for instance, which really is trying to make up the cost of these very, very expensive sports rights deals with a combination of, of just advertising and cable TV subscription fees. I want to talk just a little bit more about that because one of the things you have written, Jerry, is that the networks are having trouble paying for Thursday Night Football because the league would kind of give them the less interesting games, and there wasn't a lot of advertising revenue, or there wasn't enough. Whereas Amazon, once you're in their ecosystem, man, they're going to push you every product under the sun, and it's like right in front of your eyes, so they could see a way of doing it without having to get advertising. That's right. I mean, this Thursday Night Football just historically, all the big networks, Fox, CBS, NBC, they all had broadcast these games at some point and they all walked away from it because they were losing money and, and the amount of money they were spending was they just couldn't make it up on the viewership and the advertising and another thing that's really important to think about with amazon is nfl is obviously the biggest entertainment property in all of tv but they also want to get other rights the nba is a, a really big deal coming up and if you're the nba you're really looking at what the nfl has done here where they've sold long-term rights to all the big broadcasters. They've also carved out a package for Amazon. NBA is thinking about, all right, well, are we going to renew our deal with ESPN and TNT? And maybe we carve out some games for Amazon or Apple as well. The NBA, I think, was looking really closely at what Amazon did with this NFL season, how many viewers they got, because I think they are trying to replicate what the NFL is going to do and, and potentially carve out some games for a tech company. And also, Jerry, I think what was fascinating to watch is at the same time that Amazon is, you know, making this long-term deal and paying a bunch of money for the NFL Thursday Night Rights, they're also making other bets in this TV streaming ecosystem. They had a huge bet this fall with the Lord of the Rings prequel, The Rings of Power. And, you know, they think this is the most expensive scripted TV show ever made, ultimately going to be more than a billion dollars. And it's interesting to think through, like, from their perspective, those two bets, one on scripted television, one on live sports. What do you get more out of? And I would say when you think about the risk reward of those dollars they spent, the thing that's great about the NFL is even in those kind of crappy Thursday night games, like you're just guaranteed an audience is going to show up, right? And a scripted show, you know, even something as big as Lord of the Rings, you really don't know ahead of time, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? You're competing with endless choices in scripted drama. You know, there's just one NFL. There's one game on Thursday night. They're going to come at an exact time and place, and you know the audience is going to be there. And I just think that has huge value. And Amazon proving that they can put these games on without any technological hitches, to me, that just sends a big sign. You're going to see more of this. 
Felix, last time you were on this show, we were talking about how frustrating it can be for the viewers, though, when they have to remember where all their favorite shows are on all these different platforms. Do you think that people are going to want to have all of their sports viewing atomized across platforms where they have to have individual subscriptions and passwords and usernames and all that kind of stuff that drives us crazy? No, I don't think from a viewer's perspective, I think the ideal scenario would be to have one big bundle where everything's available, almost like it was in the previous era of cable and satellite. But now, you know, like it or not, this whole thing has been splintered. And you do, you kind of have to keep your little chart of which service you're going to for each game of the week. And I think that's inevitable in this stage where we're kind of in between these two eras the satellite and TV, satellite cable era that's kind of dimming, and then this new streaming era, I think for the time being, you're going to see it even more splintered. From the fans' perspective, I think, you know, if there's any consolation, it's probably this will be the peak splinter era. And I think five, ten years down the road, you're going to see more consolidation of these services, and you'll see more of these games ending up on one, two, or three platforms. Yeah, well, if you look at what the leagues have done is they're trying to balance two things. They obviously want to have lots of bidders. They want to get as much money as they can. But one of the things they're most concerned about is reach. And they're afraid that if they go exclusively on a streaming service, that they're going to lose the reach that they got on broadcast television. So what we saw with the NFL is they extended their long-term deals with the NBCs and Foxes of the world. So you still need to get paid TV, unless you have rabbit ears, you still got to get paid TV to watch the NFL, and then you've also got to have Amazon Prime Video. With baseball, I mean, it was the same thing. This baseball season, there were a lot of fans who were frustrated because the league had carved up these little packages of rights where Apple had some games on Friday nights. Peacock, NBC streaming services, had a few games on Sunday mornings. And so instead of just, you know, here's the entire season on Amazon Prime Video on Thursdays, you really had to, like, go onto the website for your favorite team and look at where, all right, where is it broadcasting now? Which streaming service do I need? Like, do I need to pay for this? So it's getting very complicated. I mean, another thing to think about with the leagues is we've seen some other really big sports rights deals where Amazon came in and actually made a larger bid than broadcast channels like NBC, and the rights actually went to NBC and Fox and CBS. One example is the Big Ten. Amazon did not get the rights to the Big Ten, even though I've heard that they made a significantly larger bid than some of the networks that ended up getting those rights. We've seen other streaming services come in and actually outbid the broadcasters. And the point is, is that these sports leagues, as much as they love the idea of having a big deep-pocketed tech company come in and throw a big check at them, they are very concerned about the fact these streaming services don't have the tens of millions of subscribers in some cases that you still do on TV. Felix and Jerry, please stick around. We'll keep talking after the break. Felix, right before the break, Jerry was talking about something interesting, this tension between the leagues where they want to make a lot of money off these uh, games, but they also want to have influence and reach and be relevant and that the streaming services don't yet have that same sort of reach. Did Amazon have to really persuade NFL to give them this deal? Streaming services offer something that the NFL needs, which is a little bit of relief from the growing anxiety that everyone has that's in cable and broadcast television. The whole audience level is sinking, and everybody is concerned about the future. Everyone's concerned about getting young viewers, getting the next generation. How are we going to prove that this thing is going to keep going stronger and stronger five, ten years out? And I think one way of doing that is doing these piecemeal deals with the streaming services, And, you know, it happens to be a moment in the evolution of the technology where, you know, luckily for the NFL, there's someone who can basically overpay for this small piece of rights as a loss leader in order to get people to come into these services. And I think, you know, right now is an incredible time for the sports leagues and anyone with any live TV rights to sell them for more than they're worth to a tech platform because all of these platforms right now in streaming are going through this evolution of their own 
where for the past 15 years, essentially, when you look at the evolution of Netflix, Netflix started off as an ad-free service, right? And Reed Hastings, the founder of Netflix, was always very adamant. We're not going to put ads on here. People don't like when their viewing is interrupted. We're a commercial-free service. That's never going to change. Well, it did change, right? This year, they finally said, you know, the Wall Street kind of was losing patience with some of these streaming services that were losing a lot of money. They said, okay, it's time for you to start making profits. And probably the best way to start making additional revenue sources is to bring in advertising, which Netflix has done, Disney is doing, Warner Brothers Discovery. All the major streaming platforms are now saying, we're going to have to bring in advertising. And to do that, you really need live programming because so many advertisers want a commercial message delivered to an audience at a particular time. And, you know, with a lot of on-demand programming, it's harder to guarantee that you can get the right demographic in front of that screen at the right time. The best way to do that by far is live programming. And the best way within live programming is the NFL. But there's a whole hierarchy and you go down from the NFL and then you get to other sports, other live performances. That's why you see Netflix now doing a Chris Rock live comedy performance. They just picked up the rights for a live award show. They're all dabbling in it because they need this to grow their advertising business, which is another reason that you can just see this is all going to grow and grow. That's right. I mean, one thing to think about, I think there's real questions longer term about the young demographic, the teenagers, fans in their 20s and 30s, and how they're consuming sports, if they're consuming sports at all. Amazon, I mean, one of the things that they were particularly proud of with this season of Thursday Night Football that they exclusively streamed was that they had a younger audience than what was on TV. But it was still a fairly older audience. I mean, we're not talking about an average age of 25. I mean, these are still middle-aged people watching on Amazon Prime Video. I mean, one thing that Amazon did that didn't get a lot of attention, they had an alternate stream, which is becoming very popular now in sports media, where you have essentially a separate group of broadcast announcers. So they had these guys dude perfect. Deion Sanders is in the building! Coach Prime! Come on in, Coach. Come on in. Honor to have you. They essentially do like sports trick shots, and they're huge on YouTube. A lot of people and may not have heard of them, but they're very big on YouTube. And they did an alternate broadcast of the Thursday Night Football. And I think that was an acknowledgement by Amazon that, you know, we also need to start reaching out and finding new and interesting ways to make live sports appeal to the younger audience, which is really what the advertisers will pay more for. But, you know, I think if you ask any 19 to 25 year old, how are you consuming sports? They're probably watching highlights on Instagram or TikTok or Twitter. Are they watching the live game? Are they watching a four hour baseball game with their parents on the couch? Probably not. So I, I think longer term, all of these broadcasters, whether it's Amazon or the traditional TV networks and the leagues, how are we going to appeal to people who just don't watch TV the way that previous generations did? Felix, I guess one of the reasons why sports are so lucrative and they're able to get these big advertising dollars is that if you just look at, like, I don't know, the top 10 shows by audience for a year, a lot of them are sports. Is that right? Yeah. One of the most dramatic statistics I saw was an article from Sportico recently that looked at the top 100 telecasts in the United States in 2022 82 of the top 100 were NFL games. And then you go down the list, and it was like Kentucky Derby. There were a couple NBA playoff games. There was the World Cup games. It was basically all sports. Um, and it's the one thing that's really held on to an audience in this broadcast cable ecosystem where, you know, not too long ago, scripted dramas like The Walking Dead on AMC were drawing huge audiences. People were still showing up and like, you know, want to watch their hour drama. That has just collapsed. It's just cratering. And that audience, it's disappearing. It's not coming back. And, you know, all of these giant media companies are really dependent on the prior existing ecosystem to feed them revenue and profits. And they need to hold on to whatever is there in order to fuel their growth and their investments in streaming. 
that puts you know these audiences for these live events it makes it even that much more important because everything else is just falling away yeah that's right i mean if you think about all the scripted dramas the reality shows they've all for the most part i mean they're moving increasingly to streaming so it's it's not so much that live sports viewership is like going through the roof it's fairly flat it's just that everything else in the tv landscape has really declined because people expect to get it on their streaming service we'll be right back So if you're the NFL, you're in this enviable position. You're on the networks and advertisers are willing to pay top dollar for this huge audience. Or you say the streaming services, well, you can't deliver us a big audience, so you have to pay top dollar. And either way, the NFL gets paid. Do you think that this calculation is just going to start to move from we want relevance to we just want the highest bidder? I think at some point there'll be a convergence of those two things. I think if you just look at the trend lines, the percentage of overall viewing that's taking place in the old world of broadcast and cable television versus like the new world of streaming, every year it just tilts a little bit further and further and further towards streaming. So eventually there will come a point at which the streaming audiences will be developing not just the buzz of a younger audience, not just the buzz of a new ecosystem, not just, you know, the ability to overpay for these live TV rights as a loss leader to get people into their platforms. But at some point, they're also going to have the biggest audiences and the most viewers. And then the advertising will also follow over there. Is that a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? I think that's the question that everyone's looking at is at what rate will this all continue to migrate? Jerry, live sports can be a giant money printing machine, but not everyone is getting rich. You recently wrote about Diamond Sports Group, which is the largest owner of local sports channels, and they've been having a tough time. What is happening? Diamond Sports, it's a company that's owned by Sinclair. And a few years ago, Sinclair bought about 20 of these regional sports channels from Disney. So Sinclair really bought these channels at a really bad time. This was when cord cutting was really starting to accelerate. Just to step back a little, these are local sports channels in dozens of markets across the country. If you live in Cleveland and you want to watch the Cleveland Indians or the Cavaliers, you're subscribing to a Bally sports channel. They're called Bally Sports because they did a deal with Bally, the casino company. But there's a lot of these channels around the country where local fans are watching their local home team through these cable channels. Their subscribers are declining uh, because people are cutting the cord. This is a company that was under an enormous amount of debt and is now really struggling to make the interest payments on these debt because at the same time, they are paying Major League Baseball, the NBA, the NHL, increasing amount of money for the rights to broadcast the game. So you've got cable subscribers, which is how they were paying for these rights. Those are declining. The rights fees are going up. You're already under a mountain of debt. And what will be really interesting and why it's such a huge story is because these media rights payments that these sports channels pay to the leagues, that affects everything. That affects how these teams decide the salary cap, how much players are getting paid, depends in large part on how much money they're getting from these sports channels. So it's a fascinating story that has a lot of big implications for the entire sports industry. I'm curious, Jerry, who wins out of this? If the regional sports networks kind of fall apart, that audience has to go somewhere, right? Well, I I think Major League Baseball is looking at what's happened with these channels, and they would like to take the rights back. They would like to do some sort of streaming service of their own. I mean, this is a business that was relying on a certain number of cable subscribers who were paying fees to these channels, whether you watched them or not. And then not only were they um, losing cable subscribers over the last few years, but then your cable provider would maybe put those sports channels on a separate tier where not everyone was subscribing. A lot of people who didn't care about sports were still paying to subsidize the sports fans. And that model is starting to fall apart. And I think the sports leagues are frustrated with 
what's happening. They're frustrated that these sports channels are losing subscribers and they're looking to take their local rights back from these channels and maybe do their own streaming service. Maybe they could partner with an Amazon or an Apple or somebody else. Uh, but it, it's the next few months are going to be really interesting. Felix and Jerry, Super Bowl coming up. We're talking about football, so I would be remiss if I didn't ask. Uh, Chiefs or Eagles? Eagles. Chiefs. Okay, there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Smith, Felix Gillette, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Wes. You can read more from Jerry Smith and Felix Gillette at Bloomberg.com. And shameless plug here, check out the book Felix has written with John Koblen. It's called It's Not TV, The Spectacular Rise, Revolution, and Future of HBO. Uh, as I promised at the top of the show, Tim O'Brien is here, my colleague and host of the new podcast, Crash Course. Hey, Tim. Hey, Wes. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to talk to you about this. Tell us about Crash Course. What is the podcast all about? Crash Course is all about disruption in the business, political, and social spheres with the idea that people can learn something from those collisions. So Crash Course is a play both on a collision and a learning moment. And so what we try to distill in each episode is an understanding of something that is epic in terms of the nature of the collision and then instructive in terms of the lessons we can draw from it. So give us an idea of some of the episodes you've done so far. Well, you'll be shocked to, to discover that we launched with Elon Musk. Sure. Who is, is sort of the uh, red meat repository of disruptive moments. Like a literal and figurative, metaphorical and actual collision in, in every any, day. In every way. We could probably just do 365 <laughs> days a year of Elon Musk. But we chose to do just one. Uh, we also did an episode about the pharmaceutical companies and the COVID vaccines and the collision between their inventiveness and their greed. We did, a, I think, a wonderful episode about the turmoil at the top of Disney in the cage match for the CEO suite there. And we have a multi-part episode newly launching that we're very excited about, about sports gambling, the sports gambling boom. It looks at the growth of sports gambling itself. I sat at length with a very hardcore sports gambler in Chicago and sort of watched him ply his trade. Um, I sat in London with digital gumshoes who track match fixing and corruption. And then I spent time up in Foxwoods, a, a tribal casino in Connecticut to look at how sports gambling's challenging an industry that's made a lot of money for Native Americans. You know, this is such a huge issue. We did an episode recently about the UK uh, online gambling problem and how this has just become a really bad uh, problem for gambling addiction and how it's now heading to the U.S. And I have to say, everywhere I go online now, the ads for online sports betting, they're everywhere. It's just taking over the internet, how they are pushing these new betting platforms. And TV and probably every transit station you move through too, yeah, it's exactly. wallpapered with sports betting ads. Um, you know, odds now scroll across the bottom of the TV screen during sporting events. It's, it's becoming really woven into our daily lives. And I think one of the things that's so important about what happened in the UK is it's a precursor. We can learn from what happened over there because uh, the U.S. has never really confronted or tried to contend with something of this scope around gambling. Yes, there's been casinos. Obviously, there's Vegas. There's been, you know back alley betting for eons. But it's now been wedded to the internet. It's getting legalized. It's in kids' backpacks. It's in people's living rooms. It's in people's pockets. And it's going to change how we relate to money, sports, and one another. You're going to be doing three episodes on this subject. Is that right? Three of them. And I think, you know, it's a narrative approach. I think it's immersive. Our listeners get to meet the people we're meeting. We take them inside those people's worlds. And I think it's a deep, immersive dive into this phenomenon. And it's one that we're particularly proud of, but we'll still have to earn our listeners' loyalty. What's the best part about doing the podcast so far? The privilege of getting to understand why all of the crazy, destructive, and confounding, and inspiring, and innovative people who float around us do the things they do. Tim, thanks so much for coming on and talking about Crash Course. I love listening to it. I'm really looking forward to listening more. Thank you, Wes. Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. 
For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us questions or comments to bigtake at bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is Vicki Bergolina. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Our producers are Mo Barrow and Michael Falero. Rafael Amsili is our engineer. Our original music was composed by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back tomorrow with another Big Take. <laughs>